Thanks for coming. Um, just before we get into the meat of the talk, um, I just want to, let's see um, how many people have heard of Docker so far. Can you raise your hands? Oh, fly me, right. Um, maybe just a few people I've spoken to, they, they hadn't um, heard of it. How many people um, are, uh, have, are using it, have used it? No? Okay. All right. Cool. Okay. Um, how many people have, well, it's a Friday today, so hopefully nobody is uh, doing a deployment on a, on a Friday. <laughs> yeah. But um, how many people were deploying this week? This, yeah. And how did it go? Did it go to plan? Yeah, it, it's, it's interesting deployments. A lot of companies I've worked in, um, I've seen that when it comes around to deployment time, a lot of emotions are, are kind of generated. It's really interesting. And it's interesting, you know, it's really interesting. Because um, I wonder if that's the type of emotion that you kind of go through. And literally, I was, I was sat with... Um, um, uh, my team a few weeks ago, and, and I, they were all just gathered around a computer. We hadn't deployed a certain application for a few weeks, and literally this, is what, <laughs> this was the situation. We were scared that we were going to deploy to production and we were going to break something because it had been so long since we've, we've uh, deployed into that environment. Um, even though we had automated processes to, to deploy our application, but we were still not, not that confident. Um, when it comes to deployment, it helps to know how to start a deployment. So you open up a, I, I do a lot of my work in Visual Studio, as, as, as you guys do. Um, you open up a solution, and there's all sorts of projects in there, web applications, maybe some console projects, and what have you. Maybe with an Umbraco site, it's a little bit easier. You know that this is the thing that's going to be deployed. But in a general .NET solution, it can be a number of things. Once we, um, um, uh, once we got past that stage, then we might have some automated tooling, and then the automated tooling is going ahead and doing some magic in the background, and we're not quite sure um, when that's going to end. It's out of our control. We're just waiting for a green tick or a red cross. And then finally, we hope that it works. <laughs> and then there's, there's this dev and ops thing where, you know, yep, it, you know, it works on my machine, but uh, now it's your problem because it's in production. So, um, thanks for coming to the talk. Um, I'm going to be talking about running your applications, and in particular, running Umbraco inside of a, a, a Docker container. Docker is a, a very um, hip word, and it's the thing right now. Um, it has been in the Linux world for a few years. Um, the reason why uh, there's more renewed interest now is because they've, um, uh, they're bringing the whole tooling and all of that stuff to the Windows uh, uh, ecosystem. And so it's generating a lot of interest uh, in, um, in running applications inside of here. So um, we're going to run through what a container is um, and why they exist and what the use cases are. We'll, we'll have a look at how they work in Windows. We're not really going to talk much about the Linux kind of implementation. Um, some of the tooling that you'll use, although actually you won't use it because of uh, where Umbraco is right now, um, but I'll, I'll, g I'll get into that. Um, we'll have lots of demos. Now, unfortunately, I know um, watching demos of, um, uh, of people typing things into terminals isn't the most exciting, um, aren't the more, most exciting demos, but there is a little bit of that, um, but, so just bear with me. Um, what we're not going to look at is like how do these containers actually then run in production? Because running containers in production is what we normally call the or like orchestrating containers. That's quite a large subject, and I'll mention a few things, uh, but we're not really going to go, um, go into that side of things um, too much. And s the tooling still is, uh, uh, well, some of it is in beta, some of it's um, um, actually been uh, released, um, so stuff could break, but I've run through a few things and it should be okay. Um, just, um, it's a little bit about myself. But I just wanted to add to the um, really interesting slides that we saw earlier on about um, HQ and all of the things that they do. Well, I'll just throw in uh, my little bit. I'm, I'm an aspiring horseback archer. So um, outside of work, I, I actually, um, I'm an archery coach, and I'm learning to horse ride at the moment, and I'm hoping to do the two things together. So um, <laughs> hopefully if I, uh, uh, sometime next year, I'll, 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 be, uh, I'll have some cool photos to add into this slide here. 
get out, get out the way if you see me coming. <laughs> um, right, so um, like I mentioned um, a, few, a couple of years back, I think it's late October 2014, Docker and Microsoft made a, a strategic partnership that they will bring the Docker tooling over to the Windows uh, platform. It was, just, it was a, a, like a commercial partnership, and it's really important because that sort of thing means that this isn't just sort of left to the open source world to kind of fill in the gaps here, but this is actually um, two entities getting together and saying, right, okay, this is how, you know, we're, we're definitely going to do this. Um, containers comes from the Linux world, and they've been running containers um, for a very long time. And within Microsoft Azure, you could uh, spin up a, uh, a Linux uh, machine and run containers inside of that context, and Microsoft supported that. But here, we're now going on to um, talking about running them natively within Windows. So um, to understand what a container is, we have to understand the story of virtualization. We, um, a long time ago, feels like a long time ago, we had these physical machines um, running in racks where each machine had, was purposed for something. It was um, you know, a web server or a mail server or what have you. It wasn't always the best use of those resources. And so then people came up with a technology called virtualization where we took each of those machines and virtualized the hardware and presented it to, um, uh, the, um, presented it to our operating systems inside of um, a machine. So we had maybe five machines running um, as different services, and then we can move to one machine running five VMs um, inside of that. So the idea really is to vir we will virtualize and emulate the hardware and presenting it back to the operating system. Um, we had, um, it's not the best use of resources when we had those physical machines, and that's why you see on mass pretty much everybody has kind of moved to virtualization because it is the right thing to do. Um, we use, you know, you recognize some of these products. Um, we've been using some of these in, in that whole virtualization um, strategy. Um, containers is like the n evolution of virtualization. It's the next step in virtualization. So we went from uh, physical machines to virtualized um, uh, operating systems to now virtualizing our applications. Creating a container means creating a safe space inside of which your application can run without affecting any of the other applications on the operating system it's running on, effectively sandboxing your application. Um, why, why, would, why would we want to do this? And why are we virtualizing at this sort of level? Well, what we can do is we can achieve a higher density of applications running on the same physical machine um, than we could do with a virtual machine. And with a little bit of added security and assurance that that application um, will not affect some of the other applications running on that same machine. So, um, so we'll achieve a higher utilization, better density of our, of, of our um, uh, equipment. So we have um, a, a host, what we call a, a container host. Um, that's just um, in our Windows world, it's a Windows Server. In Linux, they, they, they have um, uh, just a, a normal Linux machine, uh, any Linux distribution. And then these containers, and to each container, it appears as if that is the only thing that's running on that machine. So the container thinks it's running in its own machine, running in its own operating system. If it had a look, if the container inspected the disk, it would see um, only the files that it was allowed to see. It, it would appear to itself that I am running on a vanilla operating system, even though you may have applied lots of customization to that. Now, talking about containers, we can't, I, I, I can't not talk about containers and show you shipping containers. So the idea of containers kind of comes about from the idea of shipping goods. Goods and goods, shipping goods was, um, the industry of shipping goods was transformed with containers. If you imagine, like, I don't know, if we took all of these chairs and tables and, and stand, and we were to ship this halfway across the world, if we were to load this on a, on a boat, it'd be enormously difficult to secure that because of all the different shapes and sizes of um, uh, the, the goods we're, we're, we're transforming. So a shipping container, 
came along, a container came along, where we can throw whatever we want inside of that container and our dockyard, our uh, lorries that are uh, uh, transporting these containers around the shipping, uh, the, the large uh, container boats, um, can all use a uniform interface. They know the dimensions of the container. They know that they can hook into the container at certain points to lift them, to move them about, to secure them. Um, so the so the, it's almost like an abstraction. Um, so we are um, um, moving containers about, and we don't care what's inside of the container. We don't care about the shape of the things inside of the container. Anything could be going on inside of the container. If you want, you could be having a party inside of a container. You can have people inside a container, but you wouldn't <laughs> want to do that. People live inside containers nowadays. Um, typical of like shipping goods, you see this sort of thing, where we're shipping... Um, Cars, you know, two cars. I mean, that's, if that was my car at the bottom, I would be really, really worried. <laughs> but um, we can, you can go swimming in a container. <laughs> um, the idea is, if it fits inside of your container, you can ship it, right? So if we can get it inside of the container, we can ship it. So now the language of, sh of starting and stopping our applications, of moving, of deploying our applications, now becomes the language of containers. So how do I start and stop a container? How do I move a container from this host to that host? Well, we have a uniform, we have a, 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 a common set of uh, commands and, and um, uh, an interface into that, so we can do that. And it's not an, a new concept. Like This is a storeroom from my, um, a, a previous workplace. Um, and I'm sure in all of our homes, we've got this sort of thing. We've got storage boxes um, everywhere. So, so Docker, enter Docker. Docker is, um, is, the, is you know, uh, 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 the buzzword at the moment, um, along with microservices and, um, yeah, Docker, uh, Docker and uh, microservices. And Docker's really enabled people who have been doing microservices to be able to... Um, really be uh, to enable the agility of uh, microservices, but it's not the only way to do it. Um, Docker is, so what is Docker? Docker is um, a set of tooling. Um, so let me just rewind a little bit, sorry. Um, Docker uh, came from a company called DocCloud. And this company was a, a cloud provider of uh, infrastructure, primarily in the Linux world. And the tooling that they'd created internally to create containers, because containers, the technology of containers was built uh, into Linux uh, a long time ago, that they um, essentially open sourced their tooling. And once they did, a lot of people found uh, benefit in that, and that's why it's really, really popular now. So um, it's now become this sort of common language between developers and operations. Be, um, operations. Um, and what does a what does the kind of the architecture look like? Um, so we have our physical infrastructure, um, our machines that are going to run this. We have a operating system which is installed on that um, uh, infra, uh, on that machine, and we call that the container host or the Docker host. And then we have um, a little application on there which is a, runs as a service called the Docker engine. The Docker engine is the thing that does all of the clever. Uh, clever bits and pieces, and we send commands into that to do to start and stop containers, to um, um, uh, and to inspect containers. It has a like a RESTful interface, so uh, you could potentially um, you know uh, um, talk to it yourself through um, if you wanted to integrate it with other systems. But you would normally use the Docker client tooling, and we'll and we'll look at that. So. On our Docker host, um, our container now, what we can do is we can now package up our application inside of a container. We can define how our application runs. The definition will then include both our, um, the binaries to run our application and any dependencies that, that those, uh, those binaries um, depend on. Um, we can def so we define all of that inside of a one single file, which is called a Docker file, and then hand that over to our Docker engine, and then it's, um, it's over to the engine to go and start and stop the, con uh, the container. Um, it does it through two, two types, two, um, there's two concepts going on here. One, process isolation, so where we're um, um, drawing boundaries almost around our, pro uh, our applications. So our applications, when they look at 
um, what else is running around them. They can't, they can't see any of the other application. They're limited to what they can see. And then the second thing is um, uh, what we call like control groups. So sandbox um, uh, presenting um, what resources the application can see. So the Docker tooling um, sets all of this up for us. Uh, so we don't have to get, in, get involved in any of this. Now, in, in the Linux world, um, this was always possible, but people were, um, you had to get into the guts and set all of these things up um, manually yourself. But now Docker kind of really um, uh, provides some nice tooling around that so we don't have to do any of that. So the, the, it, it kind of works like this. So we start with our um, client side uh, Docker CLI. That runs on our native machines or maybe on like a build server or, so, or somewhere. And that issues commands to our Docker host. Um, we'll, we'll begin with something like uh, a Docker build, where we'll say, now, um, here's our definition. Let's build a container. After we build a container, we will um, pass it back over to our Docker host. And that container lives as an image on our Docker host. Once we have that image, we can um, uh, this, the Docker daemon and Docker engine is kind of the same thing. Um, once we have our image, we can push it into a central registry so that we, can, we have a, a centrally stored location of all of our uh, container images. So that when we want to deploy these onto our different environments, like a production environment, a dev environment, a test environment, we can do that through the registry. And so the registry is almost like source control for your um, applications now. Um, and yeah, so on to sort of the, the Windows side of things now. So um, Windows Server is now going to act as a container host. So this was not possible uh, before because they were actually, this, the team over in uh, Microsoft have actually gone in and re, um, uh, redeveloped some of the kernel um, aspects within Windows Server and really gone to town and to support this in, in um, um, in the best way possible. So what we're getting now is we got uh, Windows Server 2016. That's been now released, um, I think, officially. Um, it was announced at um, uh, was it Ignite or Build, uh, one of them, uh, Build, sorry, a few months ago, but now it's now been released. But we've got three different types of container hosts in Windows. So we have Windows Server Core, Windows Server Nano, and Windows 10 Professional and Enterprise. So. What this means is in each of these platforms, we can run uh, containers inside of these platforms. So you're going to be thinking about, well, where does my application actually run now? So normally we host in IIS on a web server. Well, now we will host inside of a Windows Server host or a Windows Server Nano, and then for development purposes on a Windows Server, uh, on a Windows 10 machine. Windows Server Core, I don't know if, um, how many people are kind of familiar with this, but over the last sort of few iterations of Windows Server, Microsoft have been, also, have been releasing a version without the GUI interface of Windows Server. So um, the way that you go in and manage that um, server is kind of similar to how you manage, like uh, how you SSH into a Linux server. So it's all terminal based. Um, and so Windows Server Core is the GUI-less version of the, of the server. You can still run containers on the uh, GUI version, but uh, a container host will be uh, this, this version called the Windows Server Core. Windows Server Nano is really, really interesting now. So what they did was they took all of the bits of Windows Server and said, well, let's strip out all the bits that are not needed, like a lot of the GUI interface. So even though the GUI was disabled on Windows Server Core, the code base was still inside, in there. And, um, uh, so they've removed all of that. They removed the remote desktop connection uh, capabilities, and they, they, they stripped it all down, and they've now created an, a, a version of Windows Server called Windows Server Nano. Now, Nano is, is really, really interesting because now this so, starts to enter into the territory of competing with Linux servers. Windows Server Core right now is an 8 to 9 gigabyte installation, you know, disk and installation. Windows Server Nano um, is around about 600 megabytes. That's massive. And so they've, you know, it's smaller than Windows Server Core. Because of all of the, um, uh, the features, that, all the code base that they've actually removed from Windows Server Core, um, they actually went back and had a look at all of the security bulletins and all the updates, the critical uh, updates that they issued over the last few years. And said, so, well, how many of them would now still apply to the code that's left? 
and that's how they then get the, those stats there. That they would, you would, there'd be 92% fewer critical bulletins. Um, there'd be 80% fewer reboots. So you can see where they're going with this now, kind of operating more like a Linux kind of server, where it's going to run, you know, um, hopefully consistently for, 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 and reliably for a long time. And it's really, really interesting. Um, it's not the easiest thing to work with, Windows Server Nano. It, um, it's all um, terminal-based, and um, it's, not e it's not very simple to install things on there as well, because it is literally it's stripped down. There is not much t uh, to go on it. So, um, so Windows Server Nano can be, uh, there's only a handful of roles that you can use Windows Server Nano for. As a container host, uh, it can, um, IS server, DNS server. It can't do Active Directory, so it can't act as an Active Directory um, 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 domain controller, what they're looking for. Um, and so, yeah. So, it's kind of brought Windows now in parity, in, well, parity or on, 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 a, on a playing field with, uh, uh, with Linux. So everybody gets containers, we're all happy. OK, so now in the Windows world, they've also gone a little bit further than where Linux containers are. So what I've described to you so far is um, a Windows Server containers. And over on this side, what we, they're now called hyper, uh, there's a, a diff, another version of a container called a Hyper-V container. Windows Server containers, um, each application or each container will share the underlying kernel of the operating system. So there is some, at some level, uh, deep down, there's uh, uh, some uh, interop interoperability, there's some um, sharing of um, uh, resources, um, sharing of um, the kernel. In Hyper-V containers, it's more like running a Hyper-V virtu virtual image but using container technology. So each container that runs as a Hyper-V container now gets their own portion of the kernel. So they um, are kind of more isolated. The idea is that you will use these type of containers where maybe you have received a third party container and you're not quite sure of the code that's running inside of there and you want to run it in a more, uh, in a more um, uh, protected environment, you will run it inside of a Hyper-V container. Now on my Windows 10 machine, by default, that's the mode that um, containers will run. That they'll always run as Hyper-V containers. Um, but on um, uh, on uh, Windows Server, you can you've got the option of of running both. Um, that's important because Hyper-V containers uh, means that they're not as fast as the Windows Server containers. So starting and stopping Hyper-V container isn't as isn't as quick. Um, but they're still kind of still in the same ballpark. So like I said, the the idea is. Uh, trusted code, code that you would write, all of the applications you're developing in-house, that you'd be, you should happily go and run them as a Windows Server container, and then maybe third-party uh, containers, you'll run them as, as a, um, a Hyper-V container. So, um, right, so let's look at how, we, how we're actually going to get started with this then. So, um, Docker, I've got this tooling called Docker for Windows, so you can just, you head over to Docker for Windows, Download um, um, this install, and once you installed, basically you're ready. You're, you're ready to go, um, provided you've got Windows 10, professional or an enterprise, and you are running anniversary update, which is the most recent update. Um, so there's no more uh, service packs, or there's no more newer versions of Windows. They're they're releasing it as updates now. So um, and the anniversary update, and then earlier this week. Or last week they announced, uh, alongside the Surface Studio, they announced the Creators Update, which is going to come um, next, uh, early next year. Um, so on a Windows Server, um, there's um, a load of instructions, and I'm going to just quickly uh, skip over this bit. But basically, you can get hold of these slides afterwards. There's the, the, this link here will tell you how to set it up on a Windows Server. Um, they've actually made the process even easier than um, when I first started. Um, and you just spin up a server, and you can just call the, you can install it from the PowerShell um, uh, gallery, um, and, and everything's set up for you to go. Visual Studio, you will go over, and there's a uh, preview tool at the moment called Visual Studio Tools for Docker. So you download that and install that, and then you are all set to go. So let's switch over to 
demos. So hopefully we can both see the same thing. Hey, there we go. Right. So, Visual Studio. Let me just open up my solution here. Once you install the tooling, you will get mm, things are frozen up a bit. You will get down here. Hope everybody can see this. This little whale here. It's the Docker whale. It tells you that Docker's running. So I'm running uh, Windows containers right now. This will also run Linux containers. But Linux containers, um, although the names are the same, uh, these things are not interchangeable. So Windows, you can't run a Windows container on a Linux uh, host, and you can't run a Linux container on a Windows host. But what you can do is, with this tooling, um, you can run, it will install using Hyper-V um, a Linux server on your machine and then issue commands to that so you can run um, containers inside of Linux. Um, but we're not doing that, so that's why it says switch to Linux containers. I'm not going to do that. I'm going to stay within um, Windows here. So um, if I have a look at my solution now. So I've created a project inside of here, and all of this source code is um, uh, uh, will be available afterwards. Um, what I've done here is I've created a uh, .NET Core, uh, an ASP.NET .NET Core um, application. I don't know how many people how many people are familiar with .NET Core. Heard of it? Yep. So this is the next big um, version of .NET that's, that's, um, um, that's well, I was going to say on the horizon, but it is out. Um, anybody using it? Anybody got any applications in production using it? No? Okay. Um, I thought so. Um, the tooling that they've released actually only works with .NET Core projects. So um, it's a bit of a shame, and I don't think anything's going to be done officially from Microsoft uh, with regards to that. So what the tooling does is, um, when you create a .NET Core project, um, and can everybody see that in the background? Yeah. Yeah, yeah it's quite big. Um, so when we add, oh, I'll, I'll, I don't need to zoom out, do I? So if we right-click on the project, we, can, um, we get this option here called Docker Support. And then with Docker Support, we get a load of um, files added to our solution. Um, these Docker Compose files and a, a Docker file. This file here is the Docker file when my Visual Studio catches up. Um, this here defines um, how my container is built. So this is a .NET Core version. I'm not going to spend uh, uh, time on this because this, it's not relevant to kind of um, um, uh, our what I wanted to kind of show here. But once you've done that, you get this option up here, which is oh, oh um, let me just see. Oh, um, for some reason it's not appearing. But um, with this, oh, I think I need to set as the start project. There we go. I get a Docker option in my um, uh, my launch uh, menu at the top. If I hit F5 now, what that will do is that will spin up a container, deploy my application into that, and then spin up the browser. It takes a little while to do that because um, at the moment it's, um, uh, it's not quite as quick as it um, could be. But what this does is it spins it up inside of a Linux container. That's not very useful for, for us because right now Umbraco uh, runs in you know, using .NET full framework. So unfortunately, you're not going to be able to use any of this tooling here. <laughs> So yeah, I kind of have to step back outside of Visual Studio and go back to the command line and some other tools I'll, I'll show you now to kind of do that. No doubt what will happen is that from within the community, or oh, Mads Christensen, I don't know if you know who he is, but he writes most of the add-ons and extensions for Visual Studio, that there will be, somebody will come up with some sort of tooling um, around that. So, um, so what I've done here is now I've got... Um, uh, let me just get rid of this. So I've created here a .NET uh, MVC 5 standard of vanilla application. And what I've done is I've added this file here called a Docker file. So um, my Docker file now describes 
how to build my application. So if I just run through this very quickly. So right at the top here, this is the most important bit of the Docker file. It says use this base image, um, bef use this base image um, uh, as the starting point for my application. So the Docker images or a Docker container, the Docker image is built up of a series of layers. So Microsoft have uh, released the official uh, base layer image for Windows Server Core. And then what they've done is they've installed IIS on top of that and then uh, created, then um, filed that off as an image. So now what you can do is you could just go ahead and just pull the IIS image and then start to build your applications. But what they've done recently as well is that they've taken the IIS image and installed .NET 4.62 inside of that image. So you're, you're ready to go. There's no... Like if you were to install IS by default on a machine, you know, you sometimes you have to go and install the .NET framework and then enable certain things inside of IS to, to, to enable that. So that's all done for you, and that's that's available there as a base image. That's just some um, um, from there. Then I issue in a command to copy files into my container. Now the process kind of goes like this: I publish I publish this site to a local directory, and then. Uh, from that uh, directory, I'm copying it into a folder called app inside of my container. And then I've run some PowerShell commands here to set up an IIS website to, to point to that local folder. So first of all, I remove the default website, and then I run, then I create a new um, IIS website, um, and that's the command uh, to do that. I'm, I'm exposing um, um, how that application is then accessed. So right now, I've got it uh, bound to port 999. Um, and then here I'm just downloading, um, I'm, I'm adding a PowerShell script, and I'll show you, um, that's just to help me kind of show um, how a container runs. So this definition here, I take this definition and I head over to um, command line prompt. So I have a tool called Docker. And just like a lot of other command line tools right now, it has... Um, it works similar to kind of like how Git works and all of that. So you have uh, the word Docker, then some command, and then some arguments that you want to um, issue at the um, at the end of that. So we're going to start with something like um, a Docker a Docker build command. So here I have. Um, I'll tell you what I will because that's not. Oops. So that command there, Docker build and then the name of the image I want to create, and then a path to where the Docker file lives. So I've got a folder on my machine here called .NET 4.6 Web Published. So that's the contents of my published application. Inside of there is a Docker file, and so I'm asking it to run the Docker file inside of that. When I issue that command, then it will um, build my image. And so uh, because I've built it before, it's really quick now on my machine. But each command I've got in there creates a layer for my application. And now if I now ha inspect my local uh, c collection of images, I can use the command docker images. And I can see here now I've got a bunch of, uh, I've got a collection of container images that are ready now for me to run. So you could see I talked about the base images that we have there down at the bottom there, Windows Server Core, Nano Server. Um, the Microsoft slash .NET um, uh, base image there is f is like to run is d the .NET framework installed, but there's no IIS on there, so you might run like a console application or something like that inside of there. And um, these base images are essentially for you to build your application on top of there. So you don't have to go and take the Windows Server core base image, which is just a vanilla operating system install and then um, add all the bits and pieces you need to, but um, you can take one of these ones and then run from there. So I've got a couple of uh, images that I've built here. Um, and you can see over here, I mentioned about the sizes. So these images are reporting eight gigs in size, but they're not actually eight gig because um, they're all using a shared base image. So then Docker has this really, really clever stuff where if they're using shared base images, it will just it just has one copy of that sh uh, shared base image. So if I'm moving my uh, container about, I'm actually only moving the diff from the base image. Um, so I, my application and any configuration that I've done inside of that. So 
what I've done is I've um, then run, um, I've then gone and run these containers. So I use the docker run command. And then I specify the name of the uh, container and it will be demo4 or demo2, sorry. And once I issue that command, it will then start the container. Now I've already started a container. So um, let's just see if I can get to that. So we just wait for this to spin up. Sorry, I'm moving between the different consoles here because the, some of them get um, tied up. So um, another command here, docker ps, and uh, because of uh, it wrapping, you're going to see different things. You're going to see things wrapped. You can see uh, the docker ps tells you the contain uh, shows you the containers that are actually running on my machine. Um, so I've got uh, these three containers um, um, running on my machine here, and hopefully um, that should run. So there. So that is a ASP.MVC vanilla application just running inside of a container. So um, it that's that's quite simple. Not very not very um, uh, not very interesting. However, this console here, what I've done is I've used I don't know if you can see at the top this .it argument, and that's uh, turned the container into an interactive container. So now it's almost like remote PowerShell, uh, uh, remote PowerShell me into the container. So now I'm actually running um, PowerShell on the container of it in and of itself. So I ran this command host name, and you can see there, and that's the name of the operating um, the, uh, the the machine itself. So Docker's actually created a name for it. If I do things like get process, I can see, so this is running inside of my container. So this looks like any other Windows application. I've got more than one container running, but I won't see um, the processes from the other container. It just looks like a normal operating system. If I look at um, the directory path there, um, I can see that um, it looks like a vanilla um, uh, machine. Now, if I went in there and deleted all of, the all of the folders inside of there right now, came back out of my container and restarted the container, it'll be like nothing's happened. Because when I start up a container from an image, it's starting up from um, scratch again. It's, it's not um, uh, maintaining any state between um, any operations. So it kind of uh, points to uh, a few patterns in terms of how we should then start to use containers. So. Uh, running your uh, web application inside of a container is something that we call a, ser uh, a service container. Um, so the idea where we start a container inside of there, there's some service that's running, and that's servicing, that's uh, responding to requests, i.e. like web requests, to that um, container, uh, for that container. Um, there's, uh, there's nothing really interesting to see inside of here, except that, um, uh, that you can also PowerShell into there. Now, I could go into here and I can start to make changes to this container, and it, um, it will keep them locally on this machine, um, but not until I commit that container and I create a new image off the back of that working image will my changes be persisted. Now, this is not really how you should be using containers, so you shouldn't be remoting, you shouldn't be consoling into the container and making changes. You should go back to your Docker file and declare it inside of your Docker file, so when it builds your container, it will then, um, it will then run, um, it will then persist, it, it will be baked into the container image. Okay, so um, let's just show you another type of container. So that's a service image. So I've got here a console application. And my console application is a very simple, it just prints out the Fibonacci series, um, or the first 15, I think it is. Uh, yep, 15 um, for the Fibonacci series. So this is just a, an exe. So my, con so my Docker file now looks slightly different. Um, we've still got some um, uh, metadata up here. But here now, all I'm doing is I'm saying, just copy the exe inside of the container now. And then when, you, when the container starts up, the entry point flag here says that this is the process that should start up when the container starts. So the idea of um, this like language about starting and stopping containers, 
the, I as a developer now say inside of this file that this is what you should do when this container starts. An operations person doesn't need to know anything about that, but knows that if I want to run this job, or I want to run this container, I can just do a Docker run on this container, and this file has already defined what will run inside of that container. So in this case, it's running this exe, and if I to head over to somewhere where I can run that. Um, so this one is... Um, I think it's just going to take a little while for it to run, but um, I'll leave it there and, um, and hopefully it, um, the first 50, uh, 15 um, uh, numbers of the Fibonacci series will be printed. So this points to pattern number two, the um, task container pattern. So you might have some console applications, I don't know, like something like um, an offline sending of e emails or something. You might have like a scheduled task that you kind of create. So you can then also take those kind of workloads and those jobs to containers as well. So there you go. It, nothing exciting, but, you know, it's there. But what we can also do then is I want to point to something else that we also do within containers is I've got a, a command here. So... If I now run my container with this command, um, here we go. Right, so now I'm passing in an environment variable into the container. So once your container is built, right? Um, I know at the moment we do things like config transformation and things like that for, to support different environments. That's a no-no with containers. With containers, what you want to do is you want to push into the container it, and set environment variables inside of the container. And you do that through this argument here. So if I'm going to spin this container up for production, I might give it 15. But um, if for this purpose of this demo, I'm just giving it five. So this now should only print out the first five iterations. So this is the, the second thing that kind of point, that points to how a container should be used is you, you push in your database connection string, your um, uh, SMTP server, if it differs between different environments, you do that through uh, command line arguments. Okay, so that will print out the first five and uh, we, could, um, we can always come back to that. So. Right, so for this presentation, I took um, Umbraco and I thought, well, let's, let's give Umbraco and see if it will run inside of a container. And um, it was very easy to do that. Um, so I started with a, uh, an empty web application, used the NuGet uh, packages to uh, bring in Umbraco into this application, and, and I've done nothing else to it. I've added my Docker file, which is here. And it looks very similar to the uh, Docker file I showed you earlier on for the uh, MVC5 uh, web application. There is actually nothing, diff nothing different. Um, and then um, I can run this as a container now. So if you give me, right, let's see, it's this IP address up here. So start um, 172.31. So I'll cross my fingers. Hope this works. So it's just a vanilla Umbraco um, application, and it should do. It should. We should see the um, initial setup screen for that. Whilst that's churning away, so. Um, it's no different to the MVC5 application because it's just, it's like an MVC application. Um, and um, right now, like I said, with the tooling and stuff, you, the, you'll go back into um, uh, c command line to, um, to build these things. Now, no one's expecting you to be defining these containers and, and building the definitions by hand. Um, there we go. Excellent. Eventually, it will load up. Okay. So it will run inside of a container. However, 
this is not, uh, don't, uh, what we don't want to be doing is like creating a um, base level Umbraco container and then building our applications on top of that. What I've, what I've done is I've created the Visual Studio project, published the project, and then run my Docker build to create my container. So your current Umbraco sites, you do the same sort of thing. You would publish and then um, I guess right now, uh, you know, a lot of people are using things like web deploy and things like that um, uh, to, you know, deploy to IS websites. Well, you wouldn't. You'd just publish to the file system, one of the options in Visual Studio, and then just copy those files into the, into the container. Now, you wouldn't be doing any of that. Your build server will do that. So you can automate all of these commands so the build server um, can run all of these commands for you. So... Um, that's really good. I was, I, was really, I was a bit worried that maybe we won't be able to get Umbraco uh, running inside of that, but there may be some other things that we might need to tweak uh, depending on the kind of things that you've actually done um, with IIS on your, uh, on your servers. So if you brought in third-party components, sometimes there's um, additional modules you need to install or handlers and all this sort of thing. So there, there will be other things that you will uh, want to do, but you will want to do that in a declarative way. So you want to find a PowerShell way of do, being able to do that or, a, or a, uh, a CMD way of being able to do that and then define that inside of your Docker file. And so then now you've actually got a pretty good description of how to build your application on a vanilla machine, but something that can be replicated uh, time and time again by a machine. So we've got like 15 minutes, I think. Oh, we've got two minutes. Oh, right, okay. So I thought it was... Um, right. Um, okay, so let's just um, let's just quickly run through this then. Uh, yeah. Sorry. Um, so that's the process that I talked about. So now what? So the kind of workflow is this: you're going to um, work in Visual Studio, commit that to your source code repository. Your continuous integration server will build that, and then build your Docker image. You can then run some tests against that if you wanted to. After you run your test, push that Docker image now into your registry. From your registry, now you deploy into your different environments. So you've got that image in the registry, you deploy it to your dev environment, QA, and then when you're ready, you can then deploy into production. So you'll have a production host, a, a QA host, and so on and so forth. So um, Docker do a lot of other tooling. It's worth having a look at this. I'm not going to go through it now, but um, it's called the Docker Toolbox. Um, there's a whole lot of tooling in here, but the one I want to kind of point out here is Docker Compose, where I've shown you one application running inside of a container, but our applications logically are an application maybe with some web services and so on. With Docker Compose, you can define that in another, defin in another file, which says, well, when you run this application, spin up a web, um, uh, spin up this container and this container and this con uh, SQL container, um, and so on and so forth. So you can compose applications um, together, and it's definitely worth looking at that. Um, I'm going to skip over that, and skip over that, and say thank you very much. Um, yeah, thank you. Just grab me, um, grab me at the end. I'm around for uh, an hour or so if you've got any other questions. All the source code and... Um, um, how you run all of those containers as well. I've got, uh, got that on GitHub with some instructions. I haven't got the Umbraco instructions on there right now, but um, I can, I'm going to add them uh, before the end of the day. Um, I've got a handful of Docker stickers at the front. So uh, when I say go, then everybody, <laughs> then you can um, feel free to take them. But thank you very much.